everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. I'm super excited to be back with you guys and get another video out. You may have noticed I've been on a bit of a break from making any videos and the background has changed. I recently moved and let me tell you, moving sucks. I don't think you realize how much stuff you have until you load it up and move. Needless to say, I moved for the most part and ready to get back on schedule. The video today is one I've been stewing on for the last couple of weeks and I wanted to wait until Game of Thrones had been completely ended and I could take some time to process the ending before getting this out. We're going to be taking a look at the five biggest things that the Wheel of Time showrunners can learn from Game of Thrones. Before getting into the video, I do want to give a big thanks to the folks over at audible.com for supporting the channel. Audible is the largest source of audiobooks out there, and they literally have thousands and thousands of titles to choose from. It's where I get all of my audiobooks, and I've made it a habit now to listen to a book after I've read it on page. It's a totally different experience, and I can't recommend it enough. If you haven't tried Audible yet, they are offering up something very special to all of my viewers. You can get a free audiobook and help the channel at the same time. Here's how you do it. Head over to www.audibletrial.com forward slash nameless and sign up for a one month free trial. You'll get to choose an audiobook for free and you can listen to it and decide if you wanna keep the service. If you choose not to, you can cancel the service without paying a dime and you keep your book. And just by doing that, you're really helping out the channel. So let's throw up a spoiler warning for today's video. The video carries a spoiler rating of red, meaning it will have major spoilers for both The Wheel of Time and the Game of Thrones television show. If you haven't watched all of Game of Thrones or read all of The Wheel of Time, there will be major spoilers, so watch at your own risk. So obviously this is a Wheel of Time focused channel, but I think it's very relevant to talk about Game of Thrones in this context as it was the most popular fantasy adaptation ever on television, and it grew the fan base for A Song of Ice and Fire books as well. As the Wheel of Time is another major fantasy series that's being adapted for television, it's very important to see what can be learned from both Game of Thrones' incredible success and its steep downfall. So without any further delay, let's get into the five things the Wheel of Time TV show can learn Learn from Game of Thrones. Number five, character driven story. Game of Thrones success was due largely to its characters and the engagement we had with their storyline. Game of Thrones downfall was largely due to the horrible conclusion that most of the character arcs had and the fact that the story went from being character driven to plot driven with characters pigeonholed into fitting a narrative. This was a major shift and there is certainly a lot there that Rafe Judkins and the rest of the Wheel of Time showrunners can learn from Game of Thrones. So let's dive into this topic for a minute. The distinction between character-driven plot and plot-driven characters is clear as far back as parts of season five for Game of Thrones, but it was most clearly visible in season seven and eight. In its first five seasons, there were a couple things that Game of Thrones did exceptionally well with respect to its characters. For one, they did an amazing job casting. Peter Dinklage as Tyrion Lannister, Lena Headey as Cersei, Charles Dance as Tywin Lannister, Sean Bean as Eddard Stark, and the other relative unknowns that were cast were mostly spot on. By pulling in such high caliber actors and actresses, the characters were fleshed out on screen in far more believable ways. Secondly, the characters on Game of Thrones grew very organically, and their choices always had consequences. For instance, Bran being pushed from the tower at the end of episode one after seeing Jaime and Cersei was the beginning of a war. Ned's refusal to forsake his honor lost him his head. Rob's choice to forsake Walter Frey's daughter in favor of love cost his family and his army their lives. We become invested in these characters because they were consistent and their decision making in the plot that they were a part of never felt manufactured or fake, but rather a natural consequence of what came before. This is due to George R.R. R. Martin's writing style. In the writing world, there are two types of writers for the most part called plotters and pantsers. George R.R. R. Martin describes these two types as architects and gardeners. Plotters or architects, as Martin calls them, are known for planning and outlining their stories before beginning. By doing this, they can have fast-paced stories with very satisfying ending. Pantsers or gardeners are known for writing as they go without much of a plan to their story. This style of writing allows for rich and complex characters that drive the plot around them. This is very much the style that Martin is in. He refers to himself as a gardener as he plants a seed in a character and nurtures it and allows it to grow organically. This allows for organic stories, but also tends to keep the story from having a real tight fit narrative. So what does this all have to do with character development? Well, when the Game of Thrones showrunners had Martin's source material to work with, they could allow the characters to drive the plot and their decisions all made sense. Hence, their arcs were outstanding and relatable. Even with the villains like Cersei and Tywin, they had believable arcs and we could empathize with their decisions often, which is why most people feel like the characters in Game of Thrones have gray area. Once they had passed the source material, they made the choice to try to wrap up the series in two shortened seasons 
And so now they worked backwards on the plot and tried to fit the characters into the plot that they wanted to have. This was extremely evident in how out of character many of our favorite characters became in the last two seasons. D.B. Weiss and David Benioff changed the style from being gardeners to architects, and as this wasn't consistent from the beginning, it was very noticeable. So what can Wheel of Time learn from this? Well, Robert Jordan is another notorious pantser, albeit probably more of a middle ground. He always had his ending, but he allowed himself to dive deep into some of the minor characters as well, hence why we have a 15 book series. The benefit we have here with the Wheel of Time is that it is completed and it has a fairly satisfying ending. The characters benefit from being written by a gardener, but because we know where it is headed, we know that they will get to the ending without needing major changes. So the focus here has to be casting the right people and making sure to capture the voice and personality of the characters that Robert Jordan wrote. There shouldn't be a need to fit the characters into a plot, so the focus needs to be on dialogue. Dialogue is what drives character development in a television series or a movie, as we don't get inner monologues like we do in books. So we have to learn about our characters through what they say. This point can be illustrated perfectly by this graph. It has been floating around on Twitter this week and perfectly illustrates the decline in the development of the characters in the Game of Thrones. As the dialogue shrunk, so did the character development. It is going to be so, so important that the character dialogue, relationships, and interactions are the focus of the storytelling rather than explosions and action sequences. They have their place, but never as the focus of the story. Number four, foreshadow well. One of the main disadvantages that Game of Thrones had to a series like The Wheel of Time is that it was unfinished at the start of filming. Because of this, there was only so much foreshadowing that could be done early on. Is this important though? I believe it is for making compelling television. And let's take a look at a few examples from Game of Thrones to illustrate this. The most famous example of foreshadowing was the true parentage of Jon Snow. There were seeds of this all the way back to episode one of the show, and because this mystery was hinted at throughout the series, it drew fans in and incited speculation among the fan base. This type of subtle foreshadowing creates great interest and keeps fans coming back. The visions Danny had in the House of the Undying in season two came true in the final episode and hung over the events of the series to that point. We were always trying to decipher the meaning of those visions. These were some of the examples that Game of Thrones used correctly. However, there were some examples of foreshadowing and prophecy that were left out of the show that could have been intriguing simply because it was an unfinished story and because there was no end, there was nothing to foreshadow. For instance, the Valonqar prophecy was a storyline left out of the show. When done well, foreshadowing provides heavy engagement and ties storylines together. Let me give you a couple examples from movies as well. Fight Club, Interstellar, the Usual Suspects, The Sixth Sense, and Signs are all examples of subtle foreshadowing and twists in movies that help lead us to an ending. Luckily, this is something that Robert Jordan was exceptionally skilled at. He began foreshadowing from the very beginning of The Eye of the World and has subtle hints throughout the other novels. In fact, the books are full of foreshadowing, prophecy, and hints of what is to come. This is something that should not be shied away from at all and should feature heavily from the very beginning of the television series. There is an opportunity here to pull off a mind-blowing set of events in the show's final season that were foreshadowed years earlier. This is gonna be a part of what will give the Wheel of Time show a very satisfying conclusion. So as to what the Wheel of Time can learn, it's more than just to use foreshadowing, but rather to execute it well. For instance, there may have been foreshadowing that Danny could go crazy and kill everybody, but it was executed so poorly that it seemed out of place to fans. Another example is Jon's Targaryen heritage, being foreshadowed and eventually revealed, but with almost no relevancy to the ending of the show. It was a major letdown and not the right way to execute the payoff to eight seasons of foreshadowing. We already know that there's a great deal of foreshadowing in the Wheel of Time with Min's prophecies, the prophecies of the dragon, Egwene's dreams, subtle character hints about who could be Black Aja or a dark friend or battle plans coming together. These all lend to great storytelling, but they need to be executed well for it to be satisfying. Number three, Creative Exposition One of the main problems in adapting a sprawling fantasy series like A Song of Ice and Fire or The Wheel of Time is that there is a great deal of backstory and history that could be easily explained in a book and difficult to convey on screen without obvious information dumps or expositional talking. This has always been the main difficulty in these types of adaptations. Game of Thrones attacked this problem very successfully in a somewhat controversial way that was at the same time a very HBO move. They employed what is called sex position. There was actually a narrative reason for the gratuitous nudity and sex in the first few seasons of the Game of Thrones that you may not have realized. This 
was done deliberately and it wasn't just for shock value. Sexposition is the use of nudity or sex to distract a viewer from an expositional dump that otherwise would feel out of place. Let me give you a few examples from Game of Thrones. One of the first examples is Viserys explaining the history of the Targaryens and their dragons in season one while spending time with prostitutes among the Dothraki. If there was not a sexual encounter involving their baths, it would have felt clunky as dialogue. The fact that you didn't notice the exposition is proof that it worked. Another example of this is Littlefinger explaining his motives and methods of betraying Ned Stark while two prostitutes basically get it on with each other and he coaches them. As he coaches them in their their act, he basically also explains what he did to Ned Stark, slowly gaining his trust and then turning on it. This is a great example of sex position at work. Game of Thrones popularized this term and concept, and while it was very controversial, it was very effective in giving the viewer a necessary exposition dump without feeling boring or out of place. Now, I'm certainly not saying that sex position is going to be necessary for the Wheel of Time, as that type of expositional vehicle seems more suited to a story and the writing style of A Song of Ice and Fire, but the concept of being creative in the way that backstory and history is communicated is going to be necessary for the Wheel of Time success. Considering the Wheel of Time is a bigger world with more history and a more developed backstory, this is going to be extremely important. I believe this can be accomplished in a number of creative ways. One, having a character like Moraine who fits the trope of the wise wizard will lend itself to expositional dumps as our main characters will be learning about the world just as the audience is. Characters like Tom and Loyal who are experienced in the world will also be great for this type of exposition. I think the show can make use of flashbacks as well to give expositional detail. I do actually think to the dismay of some fans that we will see limited use of sex position. Maybe not in the same graphic way that it was done in Game of Thrones, but characters like Matt, Elida, Galena, and even David Hanlon will benefit from this type of distracted exposition. Number two, have a plan. It's clear that there wasn't a cohesive plan for Game of Thrones from day one. I believe there was some expectation that the unfinished novels would be released in time for those corresponding seasons and for when the show caught up to the books. And because this didn't happen, there wasn't a mapped out plan from the get-go. As we've already talked about in the video, this is something that the Wheel of Time shouldn't have to worry too much about. The story is finished and they have the ability to map out the plot on a season by season basis before even starting the filming of the first season. This lesson is driven home by how much Game of Thrones failed in its final two seasons. By artificially giving themselves a set time to finish the show, they left character development aside, and it seemed like there was no plan until they decided to just end it. The drop-off in the quality of the writing is obvious, even for the most casual of viewer. I believe the lesson here for the Wheel of Time showrunners is to map out the series from the beginning. From casting, to storyboards, to special effects, and budget. Yes, there is no guarantee that the show makes it that far, but if you plan for the future, there is a much higher possibility the show will be of a high enough quality to get the full run. The series should be mapped out from the first episode to the final episode, at least in a rough fashion, so there are no surprises. And the other things that we talked about, like character development and foreshadowing, can take a front seat. Number one, don't mimic adapt. One of the things that Game of Thrones did extremely well at first was understanding that it was an adaptation, not an exact mimicked copy of the books. There will inevitably be plot lines cut, characters combined, or even cut altogether in the Wheel of Time TV show. This doesn't need to be a bad thing, and it must be done with care, and it can be a major positive if done correctly. For instance, in A Song of Ice and Fire, Rob Stark is set to marry one of Walter Frey's daughters, but decides to marry Jenny Westerling after he sleeps with her in a moment of grief. He only agrees to marry her due to his honor. There is no love, and she's rather emotionless as a character in the books. In one of the major changes from the book, the Game of Thrones show replaced Jenny's character altogether with Talisa and made Rob's betrayal of his alliance with Walter Frey one made for love. This change and the subsequent pregnancy of Talisa are what make the Red Wedding so impactful. This was a positive change in my opinion. These types of decisions are going to be all over the Wheel of Time. Although it will be desired by most, the TV show can't be an exact copy of the books. The adaptation will require some creative license to make the transition to the television screen, but it can't come across at a loss of the heart of the story and as a detriment to our main characters. We got some recent news about this as there was an interview with Brandon Sanderson recently where he stated that he had read some of the screenplays for the show and that there were some changes that he thought would be positives and true to the heart of the story. This is encouraging to me as Brandon Sanderson's approval means 
a lot to me as it goes with the Wheel of Time, but it does confirm that there will be some changes in the adaptation. Let's just hope they learn to get this correct and make the right changes. The last two seasons of Game of Thrones, although they really didn't have any material to make changes from, felt like a betrayal of many of the characters that we had come to love. Let's hope the Wheel of Time showrunners understand this and make the right changes. So those are my five biggest lessons I believe the Wheel of Time TV showrunners can learn from Game of Thrones. What did you think of my list? What did I miss? I'd love to hear your opinions and ideas in the comments below. Let's get a discussion going. If you liked the video, please smash that like button below and hit subscribe if you want to be updated when I release new content. You can hit the bell icon next to the subscribe button to get notifications. Also, take a moment and check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and you can get information there on how to join my community Discord server where we talk about the series live all the day. Thanks to everyone over on Patreon for supporting what I do here. Hey guys, thanks again and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do Mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy us a free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?